let's talk about how to deal with steep snow. I'm going to, I'm going to throw these things out there. I'm going to throw the key points out and then you guys, it'll arm you so that you can come back and go, well, what do you mean? Or what, whatnot. So if you are starting from, from hearts pass, um, chances are I'm going to base everything kind of on a normal winter, but if we get another, if it gets a drought winter, and as I talked about last night, when storms don't hit California, they're probably hitting Washington. And when they're not hitting Washington, they're probably coming through down here. So uh, one end of the trail will get more snow than the other. And that's pretty normal. The big exception was last December, uh, a couple months ago, when the storms didn't track west to east, which is normal. They actually went up into the, the Gulf of Alaska and then straight down the coast. So all of the Pacific Crest Trail got nailed in December. That's not exactly normal. Usually one end or the other will have more snow than, than the other one. So you're now starting, hearts pass. You got to go up to the border and come back and then keep going south. Always have in the back of your mind the kind of terrain coming up. Uh, I was thinking about the Kendall catwalk last night after we kind of hung up and the, the meeting closed. That is not the place you want to be when there's any kind of, yeah, shaking of heads. <laughs> no way. Um, you don't want to be on such steep, exposed, precarious. Don't forget, there's an element of wind, just like Forrester Pass going northbound. You do not want to be on anything steep when the wind is going to buffet you and maybe knock you off balance. So there are times when, like with a lightning storm, you've got to tell yourself, whoa, buddy, I'm not going to go above timberline because there is an environmental threat happening that's only going to escalate until sunset when things usually break up and, and dissolve as far as the clouds and the storm. But the same is true with, with like every night. And see, this is a tangent, but this is cool. Every night, I want you guys to be in your tents or whatever, somewhere, you know, having dinner, um, and looking at your maps, what are the hazards ahead? This is how you deal with them. This is how you get through them by identifying them first on paper. What do they look like? Know how to read a topo map. Know what a, a valley, how a valley looks different than a ridge. That's kind of really exaggerated, a gross difference. But anyway, you know, uh, when the when the contour lines are really close together, that means it's steep. When the, when there are switchbacks on the map, that means it's steep going up or down. But if it's covered in snow, it's a risk to your health and maybe life. I've had countless students fear for their lives because they brought the wrong shoes to the wrong snow conditions, and now they can't move. And if they fall, they hit the tree right below them, and something breaks in them, usually. You know, the body isn't, you're not as strong as you think you are. So, when you've got to deal with steep snow and you're early, say, say you're one of the, the, the forerunners, You've got to have the advantage to edge in with your shoes. And what I'm talking about is, get some of my props out of the way. If we can say that this is the slope, and right there, it's probably about a 30, 30 40 degree slope. And that's not typical, um, but in Northern Washington, as compared to the Sierra, Sierra, you're gonna have your 45s right up at the top. But as far as your approaches to the passes, largely they're going to be in the 20s and 30 degree range. What does that mean? If it looks like it's going to make a great toboggan run, hmm, yeah, if you fall, you're going to be the human toboggan and, and it's not a graceful, pretty picture. You're going to tumble. It's going to be nasty. You're going to be out of control until you can self-arrest and get into control. That was actually in, said in the wrong order. You've got to get in control first and then self-arrest. But anyway, what I'm talking about is you, we, we, on a steep slope, we don't walk with our feet like this. You're just going to slide sideways. If the snow is soft, sure, you can get with it, away with anything because you're going you're gonna to be punching through the surface. But say you get up there and you've got a July 1st start and it's been a heavy winter and the thaw hasn't yet kicked in, which I would think by July 1st it would have. Uh, after a heavy winter, uh, for those of you who, who listen to some of the other ones, the thaw in an area can start earlier or not start till later based on the intensity of the winter and then totally the other way around. So you simply cannot say, because everybody says, Ned, you know, what's it going to be like? I don't know. It, typically what happens, 
If it's a drought winter, the thaw may start earlier. It will start earlier, uh, a greater percentage of the time after a drought winter. Say, for example, because the locals up in Washington will tell anybody, ah, I'm not going to go backpack until sometime after July 4th, after a normal winter. Therefore, the thaw has probably had to start a month before for the trails to be somewhat open um, up there. So let's just say then that uh, the thaw starts June 4th, which is, hey, lo and behold, that's about the same time it starts in the Sierra. So let's, we can kind of go off of that. End of May, 1st of June is when the thaw starts after a normal winter. As we found down here in the Sierra, if it's a drought winter, the thaw may start early. After a heavy winter, the thaw may start late. This whole concept of thaw was never talked about until I had to get out there every, every May and June and teach for, for years and years and years. And I realized, yeah, that's a very important point to point out that what you see on the ground, what you're gonna have to deal with, and that's what we're talking about today, um, is gonna be based on how much snow fell and how quickly it is melted off or not. The thaw may start June 1st, but because of a lot of cloud cover, you know, um, you know, maybe uh, some snow events, rain will melt the snowpack and wind helps melt the snowpack. So if there's a lot of, a lot of rain that comes through during the thaw, it's gonna van the snow is gonna vanish a lot faster. So therefore we call that a more intense thaw. What you see is based on what mother nature wants to give you. So you've got to kind of be prepared for everything. You may get up to Hart's Pass and find out everything's consolidated. In other words, consolidated snow is ideal for the hiker because it supports your weight. It's refrozen every night. It goes through a thaw cycle during the day that's fairly mild. It doesn't lead to post holing. Um, so this is all pre-thaw where consolidated snow is created. So you have a freeze-thaw cycle happening all the time. Every night it's below freezing. So when you get out there, the snow is nice and hard, probably smooth, and supports your weight. And you can swing your feet with the, the help of uh, some nice, oh, God, nothing like a tangle. You know, get some hiking crampons. Wow, what the heck happened here? I tell you, don't throw things together. Hiking crampons like these Cthulhu KTSs. The main thing, see, I'm on a tangent, but let's just go with it because there's lots and lots and lots of stuff to talk about. And then I'll get back to Hart's Pass. You do not have, let's see if I can show this, go on over that way. You do not have what we call forward fangs. Your ice climbers who are going up the steep vertical stuff, they need to have points that face forward. These have points that are in the front of the toe, but look, they're, point, they're bent down. They're not pointing forward. So these are hiking crampons. The nice thing about this design is that when you're swinging your feet, you know how we go. We're, we're, we're swinging our feet and we're not really thinking twice about what's going on. And let's see if I can do this. Wow, I actually have a left and a right here. You know, typically when you're hiking, you know, you take your steps, you try and keep yourself from, from tripping over the other foot. But every once in a while, you bump into something with this foot, you know, as it's coming around and it, this, this guy's advancing, it hits a rock or a tree or a root and it bangs into that leg. Happens every once in a while, you click ankles, you know? But if it's summertime, ah, no big deal. You got lots of traction. The banging of one foot into the other foot doesn't dislodge this foot, which it might on, on snow or on ice. So what the, the, the danger is that if you have forward facing fangs, what I like to call and what was a brand name a long time ago called foot fangs, when this foot bangs into this foot, you could lacerate your leg, you could lacerate your Achilles tendon, you could not only puncture your pants or, or, or rain uh, shell, but you could get snagged up in it and then fall down. So having forward facing points in the toe region of your, your uh, crampons is not safe for the untrained hiker. So try not to um, fall into the, the way of thinking where huh, crampons are crampons, right? You know, I can go to any site that, 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 that caters to, to crampon manufacturer or whatever, and I can't think, maybe Black Diamond has them, I'm sure. Um, 
and get a climbing crampon. You know how big is the climbing market? But the, I would say that that the the through hiking market is is rapidly approaching. If if it hasn't exceeded the number of people interested in in getting crampons, so um, the safer brand, which has only been out for maybe twenty years or or so, um, they're getting hard to find. It's like this guy. It's like your whippet. They are hard to find late in the season. If you don't have your whippet yet, if you want to use it instead of an ice axe, uh, you may be sunk. You may not find one. You may have to go to eBay or, or some other location. I'm not very tech savvy, so um, I don't know where you'd have to go. But they're hard to find some of these specific uh, tools that are best at keeping a untrained, when I say untrained, I mean untrained in climbing techniques. See, the climbers have to spend time in classroom and out in the field learning how not to get themselves into trouble because they're going to put themselves on some really steep stuff that hikers aren't going to go on. So they need more specialized tools. For example, and I know we're getting into gear, but the ice axe really is the definitive mountaineering tool that helps mountaineers do what they got to do. In other words, if I'm scared for my life and I might slip and fall, they'll put anchors, they'll use their ice axes and they'll sink them all the way into the snow at their feet and they'll tie off to them in a rope that runs between each one and make sure that they're attached with every footstep. Now, no, no hiker that I know of is going to take that amount of time to, to um, guarantee their safety. Plus, they don't even want to go through a course like that. I have a hell of enough time over the last 40 years of trying to get hikers realize that it's actually risky out there. You know, and until some people have actually died in the process of trying to do a, a through hike, which really, is it a hike in the park? No, but people don't research. They don't, they, they just want to go in, in the Cheryl Strait thing. But anyway, there's a time and a place for the definitive tool most through hikers aren't trained to that degree. So they want something that, that will do, that'll protect them, that'll prevent the fall, et cetera. So therefore we're back to, and I know I'm getting off on a tangent, we're back to the whippet. I, two poles, one in each hand with snow baskets, not your little summer disc about the size of a ping pong ball. That, you can balance yourself in a very wide triangle, poles at 10 o'clock, two o'clock, feet you know, in, in the center of the clock, and you can have a really good stance. And because we move as people, we walk, we're gonna pick up one element of our four contacts on the ground, leaving always a three-point contact. That's what you want to prevent the fall. It's all about prevention. The ice axe in the hiker's hand is all about self-arrest and it's a hood ornament, looks cool on their pack. I wanna prevent you guys from falling. So therefore, two poles, should you go down, self-arrest pick is on the pole. Wow, that means you never have it on the back of your pack. It's always there to protect you. Should you go down? Do, we, do any of us know when we're gonna fall? Hell no. It's a sudden thing. It's an unpredictable thing. Now. Back to Hearts Pass. When you get there, there may be consolidated hard snow. There may be really mushy uh, um, mashed potatoes that you are walking in. And it's not really post holing because up there, uh, they get what they call or uh, fondly call cascade concrete or cascade cement. Uh, Sierra, Sierra cement is what we get down here. So uh, it's probably the latter. But anyway, um, the, so the surface of the snow up there uh, softens. So you're going to post hole maybe to your mid shin on the really steep traverses. But remember, snow, a snow pack is comprised of layers. You are glad we got into this because this is important. <laughs> With each storm that comes, that blows through the area, it's going to dump a foot, two feet, five feet, whatever. And then the sun comes out and the sun warms it. It percolates down, consolidates. You have a remaining maybe three feet out of the five feet that actually dumped. Then the sun's out for a little while. It heats the surface. It melts the surface. 
Snow absorbs water, so it's going to percolate down. The, wet, the, the water from the melting snow on the surface is going to percolate down and then refreeze at night. Over a few days of this, you're going to have an ice layer. Ice layers do not um, play well in the sandbox with new snow that just uh, is about to fall. So what happens is, is that you're going to have multiple layers on a slope. So you got a you got a four inch layer of, of powder that's consolidated. Then you got a new storm that dumps in like maybe three feet. The new snow isn't going to bond well with the ice. It bonds well with with new snow, but it doesn't play well with ice. So therefore, the ice becomes a slippery surface for that two feet of new snow to slide on. If the snow is steep enough, here's that twenty degree slope where it looks like it'd be a good toboggan run. Yeah, it's, the new snow wants to slide on it too. So that whole, that whole thing can release and slide on that ice layer. So when you're up there at Hart's Pass and you're post only to shin deep and you know that the snowpack is probably deeper than that because when you get to the ranger station at Hart's Pass, uh, the snow is at the level of the middle of the window, you know, on the building, that kind of thing. You're looking at the outhouse behind the ranger station and you see... You, you can't see anything below the doorknob. So you know you've got you know three or four feet of snow everywhere, but you're only posting to, to mid-shin. Why? Because you're on an ice layer. That should raise some alarms in your head. Because we can't punch through oftentimes and create a level um, platform for our feet, the ice is at an angle. Maybe it's thick enough after maybe a week of sunshine when it was created that it's so thick that you can't just pound through it. Your, your shoe is going to want to slide sideways. So, I mean, I know you're getting it, but I'm just going to point it out kind of graphically. If the slope is so and it's ice, meaning you can't get an edge in, your body wants to stand vertically. Your ankles do not want to fall over downhill. So you're going to try and edge in here with your uphill edge. If you can't edge in, what are you going to do? You have got to increase the bite with something like these. Note, however, and I, these are, these are too small of a size. I don't know where mine are. I've got a really old pair of of black KTSs, these are red, these are a newer model, uh, but then when I say newer, like five, six years ago, because um, I've been working for FEMA doing disaster, national disaster recovery, so I haven't exactly been buying new gear lately, but I wanna point out, and it's true for both the, the hiking crampons, okay, where'd it go, and the micro spikes, that the teeth, the teeth are nowhere near the edge. The teeth are kind of running down the middle, roughly, of your shoe. So then, and it's true with these as well. These teeth are not out at the edge of the shoe. So when you are standing on your slope and you're going, oh my God, there's an ice layer under here and I've got to edge in. And you put your crampons on and you're still really not getting much of a bite. The only way you can get a bite is to rotate your foot down so that the teeth begin to engage because they're hanging out in the air when you're, when you're standing plumb. Your ankles are gonna get tired. Hopefully you can pop through somewhere along the line and you can create a flat landing for each footfall. See, that's why one mile an hour on snow is really the reality, depending upon the conditions that you uh, are encountering out there. So underlining, one, I can't tell you what it's going to be like. You may have consolidated uh, freeze thaw, uh, hard surface snow that you can walk on, or you may have something that you punch through uh, the soft stuff on top until you land on an ice layer somewhere below that holds your weight. Uh, or you may have be, may find swimmable soup. Depends where you are in the thaw cycle, in the thaw time frame. And the time frame of the thaw can last a good month maybe two months after heavy winters, sometimes three months before all the snow is off the trail. So the theory, and I'm carrying on longer than I want to do. The, the, the theory, oh, well, I'm just going to hang out somewhere and wait for the snow to melt. Well, you may end up waiting a month. I remember when I did the Continental Divide, I waited almost two months before I could see just little spots of the trail, you know, um, and that was all fine. But um, 
so what you're what you're hearing is that conditions are widely variable variable um, i'm really not going to know what i'm going to have to deal with until i get there so therefore be prepared for anything bring your hiking crampons oh my god but now they wasted damn much what is the weight difference you guys know better than i do the weight difference between these it can't be more than, than a number of ounces. And will your muscles get stronger to, so you can afford to carry something just a few ounces heavier? Oh, but my base weight is gonna be this and that. And it's like, we're gonna all compare out on the trail and they're gonna ridicule me because my numbers aren't as low as theirs. <laughs> I, I, I know I sound like I'm making fun of it and I really kind of am, but that is so screwy. You only live once. Do you want to risk, like I told the story last night, falling on steep snow north of Hearts Pass, day one, my partner behind me, post holes, loses his balance, slides the length of a car, which isn't far, in, in maybe one or two seconds, avulses his scalp and breaks three ribs and had to be flown home. No, you don't want to do that. You don't want to have that happen to you. So go with what works. So what you're hearing from this guy is over 40 years of being out there, this is what works and this is what doesn't. You can decide for yourselves. I'm not God's gift of hikers. I've just been out there for a long time and tested a bunch of crap and thrown it out and gone and stayed with things that work. <sighs> Here's another one. If it's comfortable on you, shoes, backpack, things that rub against your body when you move, maybe the, the grip shape handle on the end of a pole. If it's comfortable for you, stay with it. It's your friend already. It's not giving you blisters. It's not tearing your skin on your back. I don't care if it weighs five pounds. I don't care, if, I don't care what it weighs. When you get out there, the most important thing is safety and comfort. You're going for the long run. If it doesn't work, you're off the trail, going to some strange store, hitchhiking in some strange direction to find a product that the local, the local pro thinks is gonna be great, but he's never done a through hike before. You don't have a clue. And now you're taking the chance for the next first few days back on trail. Once you get there, is this gonna work for me? You don't really know unless you have experience with the product. So. I'm getting to an issue that came up the other day when we were talking about, I saw every year it's shoes and it's backpacks. And those are the two things that can just really ruin your life. Um, yes, you can ask me, I see the question. <laughs> Carol, I just realized that I can actually see these things. Um, so save your questions. All right, I'm, I'm, I've just now talked about uh, how to deal with some of the steep snow. You've got to have some, some traction. You've got to have traction that works. You've got to have points on your, on your shoes that are positioned as far out on the edge of your shoe as you can get it, and you probably won't find it. So therefore, you're going to have to go with a longer point. Oh, but the K10s, the Cthulhu K10s versus, you know, Ned Show and the K KTS, the K10s have a shorter point here. Oh, I can save a couple ounces. Well, functionally, practically, you want a longer point because, oh my God, now you're out hanging on some steep slope. Yeah, you've posted in 18 inches, but you're on ice that you can't pop through and create a flat landing. So therefore your feet have to be at an angle. You can't edge into it because say, for example, you have trail runners or something with a really soft sole. And uh, that's why you have the K10s because they're designed for lots of flexing forward. That's what this center bar is all about. I mean, not only does it hold the thing together, but it needs to be able to bend. Now you see, it's not a big show for me to bend these KTSs, but the K10s are designed to be able to be a little bit more flexible. Therefore, lighter. Uh, they're trying to increase their market share and attract uh, uh, customers by having a lower weight. But out in the woods, weight the lower weight may kill you. So go with something that's durable, predictable, functional, and practical. I love saying that. Anyway, balance, two poles, snow baskets, a whippet, because it's always in your hand. Should you go down? You never know when you're going down. So have a self-arrest pick in your hand all the time. 
Oh, but it's a little more heavy than my, my, my super duper carbon, whatever. Is your, it's not carried, it's, war, it's, it's in your hand. Will your muscles get stronger? Yes. Will you learn how to use it, how to hold it in different ways that, that's gonna keep you more balanced out there? Yes, this is what it's for. Take advantage of that. Uh, all right, that's the snow thing. That's how do you deal with that? There's another aspect I, I got to address, and we talked about it a little bit last night. You, it's like with creek crossings. You do not need to cross a creek right where the summer trail does. If it's really scary to cross at the summer trail crossing, when you get there, it could be a torrent, it could be a ton of water, you're up there during the thaw, the bridge got washed out during the winter, maybe an avalanche took it out, who knows, and now you've got to do this on your own. These are some of the mountain savvy skills that you're learning as a through hiker because you can't just go home. You've got to learn how to deal with this stuff and it's going to mature you. It's going to make you wiser. Um, and you're going to learn a perspective you didn't have. Sorry for that. That's my email. I don't know how to turn that off. Um, so with snow, you do not have to be on the summer trail that's buried by four feet, five feet, six feet of snow. When you get there, it may be hellaciously steep. And, and trails going across this hellaciously steep slope. Do I have to be there? Like I'm thinking of the, the span, hopefully you guys have looked at your maps, between Rocky and Woody Pass or Passes. Can you, can you avoid it? First of all, like with avalanche conditions, you've got to identify the risk. Am I looking at something that's scary? It, it, might, it might hurt me. You've got to be able to identify it. Most through hikers are too damn focused on going fast, getting their miles in, talking about hamburgers, and they're not in the moment. You've got to be, <laughs> I don't know if you guys can see Carol's face, but I assume you can. She, it's great. You can read exactly, but it's, it's true. So when you get to Rocky or Woody, I can't remember which one's on the south end. I, I, they're opposites. The, the one, uh, it must be Rocky first because the southern of the two uh, is, has trees and the northern of the two doesn't. So Woody is on the north, Rocky is on the south. And you're standing there and you're looking across this east facing, we talked about this a little bit last night, the east facing slopes are gonna hold their snow longer than the southern and western sides of that mountain. And then when you go from Hearts Pass to Monument 78 and back, and actually throughout a whole lot of Washington, you're following ridges. And so that initial first four days where you're cutting your teeth, trying to figure out how to balance and how to save your life and what's risky and what's not and all that, you're on a ridge which isn't the safest place to learn for the first time how to, how to deal with walking on snow or walking on ice layers that are in the snowpack. So can I avoid it has to come up. Can I avoid this wild, crazy creek crossing here by walking upstream and finding a log that goes across? I mean, you gotta think that way. If you don't feel comfortable, you gotta employ the word STOP or the an, an acronym, acronym, acronym. Stop. So it stands for stop, think, observe, plan. Come to the edge of that pass. Look across the steep slope. East facing doesn't get a whole lot of hot sun like the western slope does. Has a whole lot more snow on it than you'd like. And you've got to think, wow, man, I've been on some ice layers in the snowpack that are 18 inches down. It's probably going to be the same thing on this 45 degree slope. Do I want to do that? The safest thing, avoidance, is to sit down on your butt and glissade straight down to where you get away from your 45 degree slope and you're down closer to the tens and 20 degrees that are down at the run out of this. Remember, it's probably all been avalanche. So there's no trees in this area. And you can see that on your map because it's not green indicating trees. It's whitish or tannish indicating no trees. So if I'm standing on Rocky, the southern one, and this is the one you guys are going to hit first. And I can't remember the name of the peak that's on the on the left, but anyway, glissade straight down that thing, heel plunge straight down that thing till you get to a slope that's more comfortable for your skill level, and then traverse it. Yeah, I'm going to have to climb up the other side. Oh my God, you know, yeah, it's going to be a bitch because you're probably not in shape yet. So that's just something you're going to have to do with take a lot more stops. Uh, to let your muscles uh, relax and get the lactic acid out of them. Byproducts of muscle metabolism. When you're working them, the lactic acid builds up and the muscles want to cramp. 
you know, you've got to have a lot of electrolytes, be sucking down those electrolytes, even on snow, because you're sweating, even in a cold environment. My students don't realize that till we get out there. And I'm, I want to make sure that before we leave the cars, they got plenty of electrolytes in readily available water bottles, canteens, whatever, because if it's not e easily accessible, people don't drink it. If, it's, if they're not encouraged to stop, they don't even want to try and find it. So um, before, you, before you just start charging out, and this will be true, I don't care if you're northbound on the PCT, I'm going way too long. Now, I don't care if you're northbound on the PCT or southbound on the damn thing, you're gonna be hyped up with lots of energy and you're gonna be really excited and it's, everybody else around you is gonna be go, 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 ain't this great? And you, you almost get this tunnel vision blinders on, this is gonna be fun, let's go do it. And that's all great, but the, you are in an area that's really foreign probably, unless you've done a lot of training on snow and you're not gonna know what the risk, lo, risks look like. And there's nobody else out there because you're the forerunners. And even if you aren't the forerunners, the, the guys that probably pounded in the boot track that you're you, you're now able to walk on which is wonderful because it's flat side to side you don't have to worry so much about edging in with your shoes and, and crampons and stuff like that they're nowhere near to be found you don't have that uh, uh crowd herd that you do northbound going northbound you, you you're out there all by yourself so these are the things to watch out for and understand what the, that there are layers in the snowpack. Understand also that there are objects in the snowpack that are not your friend. You've got boulders in there. You've got, you've got avalanche broken trees in there. It, you know, the avalanche came through. You say, say a cornice, you're going across between Rocky and Woody. And because it's a ridge that goes north south and the storms go east west, prevailing winds are going across that ridge. What I'm getting at is, the wind carries snow. It's called wind transport. And so all that snow that got dumped on the west side of the mountain chain, because it's like a squeegee, the mountain chain is like a squeegee and all that, all that moisture gets dumped on the west side, but the wind blows it over on the east side. What does it do? It all pillows and builds up over on the east side in these huge powdery uh, formations. And in the process of blowing over the ridge, cornices form. A cornice is like a diving board of snow. And it, 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 it projects out away from the ridge and then hooks back. So there's no support underneath it. It's just a dark diving board hanging out there. So whenever you're walking on ridges, you've got to realize whether or not there's any support to the snow under your feet. Because ridges zigzag, you're, you're able to look ahead and see where the cornices are. And you, how do I do this? Uh, you, um, uh, let's create a, a ridge line. Say this is the ridge line. Where I want to walk is not right on the top of the ridge. Say a cornice forms and the cornice is going out this way. The middle, the cornice is going to look like this on the top of the ridge. When you're on it, you're going to think, wow, hell, I mean, the, the top, the, 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 this thing's shape, it looks like the, the top of the ridge is over here. And you're gonna la di da go on along this ridge and you're not walking on any sound surface. This, the rock is way over to the west because cornices will form in the direction of the wind, which in this case is to the northeast or east. So you're gonna think, oh my God, I can walk over here, piece of cake. Wow, look at that nice view looking down there. Wow, how am I able to see that nice view? You don't know what your hazards are until you get out there or somebody tells you about them. So what the safest place to walk if you're on a ridge, which, hello, the ridges and the valleys are the safest places in avalanche terrain to, to walk. You don't wanna walk on top of the cornice. You wanna walk on the Western edge of the ridge. That's where you know you're on, on rock. Should this cornice snap and fall and create that avalanche, which is why there's no trees between Rocky and Woody Pass, you're not gonna go with it you're gonna be over on the Western edge of it. So that's just another little tidbit regarding cornices and things that can cause avalanches. You probably will not have them. Look around when you get there. If you see cornices above you, just have in mind um, when they get really heavy because the sun is hot, sun is melting the snow, there's gonna be a lot more heavy water in the snowpack and it's starting to soften. And the ice layers that are in the cornice are going to start dissolving. That thing may drop. If it drops, it's going to hyperload the snowpack below it. 
And then that's going to be triggered into a wet slough. It's not those air driven freeway speed winter avalanches. You're going to have this gooey mess moving down, 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 um, down the fall line. Yeah, you don't want to get caught in it. It may or may not be life threatening. Um, I've actually ridden them where, where uh, my body weight triggered it. Now, not because of a cornice falling, but because I was out there in the Sierra with a 100-pound sled in tow and my 170 pounds. And that was sufficient weight for an unstable snowpack because the bonds in the pack don't always play together in the sandbox. Remember, I talked about they don't stick to each other very well. So suddenly, just a little bit more weight on that poor ice layer in the pack, and that took the whole surface and moved it. It can move it in a couple of different directions, but the only thing I want to really get to you guys is just be aware that if you're on a steep enough slope that makes a great toboggan run, that thing can, could be unstable. So avoid them in as much as possible. You avoid them by going straight down and around and straight up. The, the safest routes on steep snow are not across unless there's already a trail. But even if there's already a boot track, that does not mean that all those people that pounded that boot track in place didn't take that slope to the point where it's just about ready to snap. You might be the last guy, and then it goes on you. I've seen this in ski patrol when we're, when we're detonating certain slopes to get them to release so they don't release on the public, and we're out there early in the morning, and sometimes you just, you know, you release the slope, and lo and behold, there's another layer right below that that wants to go, and you don't know it. So you go on down, you ski down to the bottom of the slope where you just detonated everything and all the debris is at the bottom and your presence on that lower layer was enough to release that one. And we've had, we've had ski patrollers caught in avalanches. This is in the winter, not the spring when you're going to be there, but that happens. Snow is not stable. You got to know the history in that pack, those layers.